Welcome to this session, Design Different, celebrating 30 years of um, inclusive design at the Royal College of Art and um, kicking off a season of inclusive design events. Um, the title of this really looks at the future of inclusive design and lifts the curtains on what goes on at the Helen Hamlin Center. Most importantly, we want to describe and share a future with you um, that takes inclusive design for the next 30 years. Um, as Bree said, um, I'm the director of the center. I have the great honor of um, holding that position and working with many fabulous colleagues who you, you will meet today. The center has done around 300 projects with over 200 organizations from communities to um, companies, organizations, large and small, public and private sector, academia and government. But at the heart of what we do is bringing that empathic human experience um, to life. So inclusive design is the heart of what we do, but it consists of two words and one of them is design. But there is a problem with design um, and it's this. Um, I should have said that um, to introduce myself, I am a person of Indian origin with black hair and a black beard wearing a black jacket, uh, lots of black going on. Um, and as I go through the presentation, I will describe the slides that um, have a visual component. If I don't describe the slides, it's because um, I'm reading out text that is on the screen. So going back to the presentation, there is a problem with design. And it's this, if you type in the word designer on an SMS or WhatsApp application on your smartphone, and there is a screenshot of this happening, what comes up is this predictive icon. And on screen, are, um, are two small yellow people wearing sort of French berets and holding a paintbrush. Are designers just relegated to being painters or artists or do we do more? Um, do, are we um, strategists? Do we give frameworks? Are we protagonists in creating the world around us? We would say yes and inclusive design was uh, defined by the UK government as including the needs of the widest number of people in your design. On screen um, is a publication in uh, red and black with the title Applied Ergonomics. And this was where the term inclusive design first appeared. It was defined by our founding director, one of the co-founders of the center, Roger Coleman, who built the center with Jeremy Myerson. We have a 30 year history that we're celebrating. We continue to talk about inclusive design. And on the right of the screen is a website called designingwithpeople.org, open access, um, open handed for you all. What I want to talk about is the future of inclusive design. What's crawling across our minds? What's in our hearts? And I call this the triangle of possibilities. That's the title of this slide. And on screen is a diagram, diagram in the shape of a triangle. At the center of the triangle says the words inclusive design at the Helen Hamlin Center for Design. And each of the triangle has a section that points to a future consideration, current and future considerations. At the top is inclusivity. Bottom right is leadership and bottom left is sustainability. So we're going to start with sustainability. There are three recognized pillars of sustainability. Um, the environmental and the economic are well established and well talked about, but what is missing is the social. And we believe that inclusive design can speak to that. The World Bank agrees. It talks about creating more inclusive society, enhancing the empowerment of citizens. It says that together with economic and environmental sustainability, it is critical 
for poverty reduction and shared prosperity. And what does it need? Social sustainability. Um, as COP26 is going on um, uh, in, in Glasgow, um, I wanted to quote something that someone said, James Gustav Speth, um, who's an activist, a designer, and a scientist. He, he said um, um, a couple of days ago, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And I think this speaks to the humanness of inclusive design and its potential contribution to sustainability. Moving on to the, the, the second corner of the triangle, leadership. We apply the um, principles, the experiences, the practice of inclusive design to broken models of leadership through this phrase that you see on screen, this area of research called creative leadership. And we talk about it having three values, empathy, clarity, and creativity. And these are not standalone. They interact, they interrelate, they mix up um, with each other, they balance each other out. If you only have empathy, you um, may be a pushover. If you only have clarity, you may be a dictator. Um, you know, dictators were very clear about what they wanted to do. Only creativity and you're a bicycle with pedals, but no chain, chains. Um, so these, we, we've done about a decade worth of research into looking at how these leadership models activate. And there's real global interest across the world in these, in these ideas. The, thir the fourth, sorry, the third um, corner of the triangle and the most important one, the biggest one on the screen is inclusivity. So I want to spend a couple of minutes on that. Inclusive design, um, universal design and design for all have their origins looking at accessibility, disability, aging. We believe that there are four core axes um, of inclusive design that we need to respond to. There's a diagram on screen in the shape of a cross um, and each uh, arm of the cross holds a word and the four words are these, age, ability, gender and race. Why? Because the same sun rises and sets on us all every day, but that day can bring a radically different experience depending on our age, ability, gender or race. So I, our thinking is that these four ideals form a basis for thinking inclusivity. You have a diversity in these four areas, your company will do better, your community will be more open-handed. Um, and there's lots of research that we want to do and pull together to really talk about this. So it signals a future for inclusive design. Um, these also speak to hashtags that you see on screen around ageism, ableism, genderism, and racism um, that are absolutely capturing the headlines, the front lines, and the imagination. And on screen, on the right, you see um, a snapshot of a talk we did last year called In Session, which was titled Exclusion, Why Design Should Be Doing More. So it really is a call to action. We want to hear um, your voices um, around, around this as we develop this. We're not saying that we have all the answers, but we are proposing that we believe that these four axes form a baseline for inclusive approaches. Um, and following the principles of inclusive design, we wanted to involve you in a short two minute exercise. So we asked this, we're asking this question of all of you, what are the factors and influences sit alongside the four axes? And I have an example here from our friend Gaurav Raheja, Raheja from the um, IIT in India. And he said, Around these four axes in India, he would suggest economics is an important factor because of economic disparity in India. So I'm going to ask my colleague Juliet to come on screen 
and walk us through the next exercise. We're going to ask you to put one or two answers either in the chat or on a Miro board that Juliet will explain. Um, in the chat function, we've put a link to the Miro board. So Juliet, over to you. And Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm a Caucasian woman with long hair and I work at the Len Amlin Center for Design. And what you will see here now on the screen is a Miro board. And as Rama said, uh, we've shared a link with you. And what we ask you to do is place those other factors that you might have in mind. I saw someone in the chat already mentioning a couple. Um, if you're not comfortable with Miro, use the chat, quick demonstration. Some of you already know to do it. If you want to place a post-it, just click on this little icon, drop it wherever, and uh, write what you want. I see it's being populated already, so I'll let you do the magic. Thank you, Juliet, and we'll give you a couple of minutes. Um, Whilst we're doing that, I can see in the Q&A a question already of how did we determine this? Um, this was really determined over 30 years of inclusive practice. Um, um, the question asks, you know, how did you, uh, did you look at income, geography, et cetera? Um, we wanted to base this on human characteristics. There are lots of models that look at income, geography, um, socioeconomic circumstance, for, for example. Um, this is our um, humanist offer. We feel that a lot of people have explored these different areas um, and we wanted to offer something different. Um, I think we'll come back to that in the panel discussion, um, but it's also to say that this is a proposition. It's something that we, we it's not a research that we finished, it's something that we're starting. So think of it as a hypothesis that we want to investigate. If you take something like race, um, which can be, you know, um, uh, uh, represent in the geographies of a city. Um, and I know, for instance, um, one of our speakers, Sean Donahue, has done a lot of work in, in this area. Um, Geography is a very loose way of um, classifying um, exclusion. But if you look at race, actually, um, people are corralled into particular areas for a particular reason. And um, with that will come um, all sorts of factors such as uh, uh, less health care, um, uh, a reduction in access to services, uh, for example. So um, whilst you're finishing off, I can see the board is getting um, hugely populated. Um, if I could um, ask us to start the presentation again and bring on our next speaker, my colleague, Thea Stanton, who will tell us a little bit about our 30 year um, edition of our magazine. Thanks Rama. Hello everyone. Um, as Rama said, my name is Thea and I'm the content officer for the research centers. I'm just going to provide a brief visual description of myself. I'm a brown woman of indigenous heritage in my early 30s. I'm wearing a purple top and I have dark shortish to mid-length hair and I'm sat against a blue background with the RCA logo. So I joined the RCA in June 2021, and I was the publication manager for this year's magazine. This is my first project for the Helen Hamlin Centre, and I hope, like me, you will find this publication gives you a rich overview of the vital work the researchers at the centre are carrying out. When Rama and I first started conversations about this year's publication, which was the second volume of the updated Design Different magazine format, the word that kept recurring in our discussions was daring. The goal of this magazine is not only to showcase the great work of the centre, but to demonstrate how the centre really speaks to current and urgent global concerns and challenges, to show how the Helen Hamlin Centre's researchers dare to meet these challenges with curiosity, compassion and creativity. Uh, we will be posting a link to the accessible PDF of the magazine, but I, would th I thought I'd give everyone here today a little preview of part of the magazine. So bear with me, I'm just going to move to the next slide. So from the front cover, you can see that as well as being 
the second volume, this edition of Design D Different celebrates the 30th anniversary of the centre and our introductory pages foreground that achievement with Jeremy Myerson, the first director of the centre reflecting back and Rama, our current director looking forward to the next 30 years. Each of the research spaces, as well as the DAI, are featured with think pieces and introductions from the research leads, as well as additional articles by research associates, really giving you a sense of the number of people and range of activity and ideas that animates the centre. I'm just showing you half of the magazine today, as I don't want to give everything away, but I wanted to finish on the central page, which in the paper form uh, is a delightfully retro pull-out poster. Um, as well as being at the heart of the publication, like Rama said, these four axes of research, age, ability, gender and race are very much at the heart of the centre and drive forward our vision for a world made more hopeful through inclusive design. I hope you all enjoy reading the magazine as much we, as we enjoyed producing it. Now, moving on to the next part of this event, I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Melanie Flory, Associate Director of Research. Thank you, Thea. The magazine still seems to be flipping through. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thea. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here today. My name is Melanie Flory, and I'm the Associate Director for Research at the Centre. I'm of Indo-European cultural and racial origin. I've got, um, I'm brown skin and dark shoulder length hair, and I wear reading glasses. This role is a newly created role, and it reflects the center's evolution, growth, and increasing global impact across a diverse range of industry and research projects and partnerships. It's a newly created, um, it's, it's a role that, that really, draws from somebody across research and industry. So my particular background in both industry research and clini um, clinically is as a psychologist and neuroscientist who studies plasticity as a brain event, um, mainly involved in the interplay between emotion, cognition and behavior. So seven years ago, I, I actually met Dr. Nanella Ivanova, who will be presenting later on, and came across my first um, meeting with design and design thinking. Uh, three years ago, um, Nanella introduced me to uh, Rama and creative leadership, and of course, the hallmark of people-centered and inclusive design thinking and practice that the Helen Hamlin Center of Design is so recognized for worldwide. My own journey of collaborating with Dr. Ivanova was about co-designing around the concept of brain plasticity. And so we created a series of workshops and a diverse range of, for a diverse range of clientele and topics that relate to organizational behavior and organizational growth and professional development. And this opened up new career pathways for me. And here I am working alongside the very people who've introduced me to the power of design to translate lab-based evidence into quality of life options for children and adults. Um, what you see here on the screen looks like very fine threads um, that are of different colors intertwined. This is actually a picture of the, act, the brain in real time uh, activity um, through an MRI scan. And that is what plasticity is all about. This that you see on the screen is the project that I did with Dr. Ivanova in which we used the textures. We used textures as a means to shift emotion. So by feeling textures, you can um, mediate various emotions. Um, and the other picture where you see a human hand touching an artificial hand is about using textures and the feel of textures to actually mediate a prosthetic limb. 
So this is really the scope, so, and it continues to share, shift and change on a daily basis for neuroscience and design when they synthesize and when they intersect. So the frontiers of neuroscience and design are rapidly shifting, and not least due to the extended applications of technology um, that have given 3D brain functional mapping uh, to scientists to be able to look at the correlation between the structure and function of very specific neural sites, very specific groups of cells and across networks of cells. So we at the Helen Sam Hamlin Center stand at a very exciting, but a very responsible juncture of interdisciplinary research and innovation for neuroscience and other disciplines such as engineering, computer science, economics, and aging. But for me, the intersection and the synthesis of neuroscience and design has become the focus of my inquiry and my passion over the last decade. There is huge potential and opportunity for both disciplines to collaborate and extend the boundaries of research and innovation that is people-centered and inclusive. And the advances in technology have made the global today's local. So our designers and our design researchers are increasingly engaging with the UK's Build Back Better program of growth through research and design across projects that span public, private, and third sector partnerships. The scope of intersecting neuroscience and design to build back better is absolutely immense. And it is rich, whether it is within the context of the new and emerging workplace, education, healthcare, community, and the longevity economy. What we are coming to realize is that partnership of neuroscience and design and design with neuroscience has begun to open new doors and vistas for the Helen Hamlin Center of Design. And without further ado, let me introduce you very briefly to three ongoing research and design projects uh, that will demonstrate this. So the first one is creative leadership that Rama actually mentioned a little earlier. This is a tripartite model pioneered by Rama. And prior to the introduction of neuroscience, the design research inquiry focused on the delivery and the receptivity of creative leadership across diverse demographic audience. But in the last three years, the interdisciplinary journey of design and neuroscience for creative leadership has issued in the next stage of research, which is about the convergence of design and neuroscience to build a developmental spectrum of cognition, behavior, and emotion that corresponds with these three components of empathy, clarity, and creativity, because none of them, not, neither of them are actually absolute uh, personality traits. We're also working towards developing a comprehensive grid of key performance indicators of empathy, clarity, and creativity in everyday and longer-term organizational le leadership, growth, and development. And now project two, which is, this was a, um, what you see is the word resilience. It's the re resilience report that was generated by the business impact section of the Helen Hamlin. Um, this was a design consultancy project with a smartphone company. In this project, the neuroscience evidence relating to thinking, emotions, and behaviors of resilience informed and shaped the aspects of the design thinking and activities of the project. So the leaders, the designers in this project incorporated some of the evidence base uh, on resilience into their exercises in building continuity for smart, the smartphone industry. And finally, I'd like you to bring you to one of our most exciting projects. This is um, a wearable med tech. So what you see on the screen is um, a woman in a, in a jumper. It looks very ordinary. She's wearing ordinary clothes. Um, but on 1st December, we, we like to call this in-house, we affectionately call this the Smart Yarns Project. On 1st December, we'll be opening a new wearable med tech lab, which is all about innovating the next generation of smart garments through the intersection of design and neuroscience. This lab will investigate the use of garments and medical devices as therapeutic tools for recovery in the first instance 
in post-stroke. And then we will go on to integrate them into other areas of recovery, not, but also to address uh, issues such as inclusion, per personal identity, um, compliance and independence in self-care. So finally, we come to the neuroscience and design model. This is a model uh, that Ninella and I, um, Dr. Ivanova and I proposed in 2019. And the built-in capacity of this model is its ability to address the urgent need to shift from short-termism to long-term thinking, to embed empathy, as you'll see in the first quarter of this uh, diagram of the brain, to embed empathy in organizational performance and growth measurement. Um, together, neuroscience and design have a major role in advancing the language, attitudes, behaviors, and policies and part of partnership and inclusion. Um, so I will end on that note, um, and I'd, I'd really like to share this quote with you, where Leffa and Meinl have said, neuroscience, neurodesign opens up a wide perspective for many new research questions and practical projects. We are living this every day in the Helen Hamlin Center. And I'd like to now hand you over to, hand back to Rama, I think. Great, um, thank you, uh, Melanie. And it explains why at the Helen Hamlin Center, we now have a neuroscientist as part of our group. Um, we now have three quick fire presentations, kind of, you know, three to four minutes each um, from three of our research leads, um, Dr. Chris McGinley, um, Dr. Ninella Ivanova, and Sean Donahue. Um, all of whom will tell you what we're doing, give a quick snapshot, and then we'll invite them back for a panel discussion. So Chris, over to you. Thanks, Rama. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Chris McGinley. Uh, I have a Scottish and Irish background. So I'm in my 40s. I have white skin and medium length, dark brown uh, hair and beards, and I'm wearing glasses. Um, I lead the Age and Diversity Research Space and the Design Age Institute's Research Unit. Excuse me. I've just got a little delay here. So on this first slide, there's a build on the design dot different title. We purposely lean into difference. The slide reads how we do it. We connect difference, we converse difference, and we collaborate different. On this next slide, it reads as follows. Our work explores the role of design and empathy to improve lives, considering the broadest dimensions of age and diversity. This is how we approach underexplored experiences, and this is how we design different. I'll now give you a quick taster of six of our current projects, all of which are further detailed in the magazine that Thea mentioned earlier. So on screen here is the Connected Places Catapult logo. Below it are images of a project report titled Meeting the Aging Population and an illustrated page full of information relating to an older couple, Harry and Ida. This Personas Plus insight sheet is one of a series that summarised the experiences of different people, all considered older, yet all living profoundly different lives. So really highlighting the age alone doesn't define experience. On the next slide, we have the Invisible Creations logo. The image shows a stack of concept sketches and we've developed strategies and concepts through engagements with over 20 older people across the UK and now have design concepts ranging from the why hasn't someone thought of this before kind to the more future facing notions that embody the ambitions of invisible creations. The next slide has a logo for Heart and Soul, who we continue to work with, this time on a new two year project funded by the Health Foundation and we're pursuing equitable health services for people with learning disabilities and autism. You can see below the logos two pictures of co-design activities being undertaken by a mixture of talented, neurodiverse new designers. In the next slide, we have the logo for Tata Consultancy Services and two images showing people with low vision interacting with digital devices in different ways. We're advancing our previous work on vocal accessibility, also involving the British Standards Institute this time, to develop a publicly accessible standard. In this slide, we have the King's College London logo. In our PACES project, we continue to explore non-biased monitoring of children with ADHD, and we're at a really exciting stage of prototyping. So the picture on the left shows how children communicated and designed with our researchers remotely, 
and the picture on the right shows a new product which will shortly be on the wrists of the very same young people who helped us get here. On this next slide we have Cartwright Picard's logo, our new knowledge transfer partner. This pathfinding project will develop new typologies for later life living and the image shows different generations of relaxing in a cafe and a building next to it called the Reeds which also includes a large ground floor cafe and that's a hub open to all. It's easily accessible to the 13 social housing flats also incorporated in the build. And finally, one of our Design Age Institute's research projects, of which there are many. On this screen here, we have the web page for our new Design Age directory. This is a showcase of some of the UK's strongest talents in the space, and we want you. So uh, please do have a look uh, at it. I think it's just popped up in chat. And if you have uh, an inclusive service design to offer, please join. And I'll leave you with this final slide which simply reads, to neglect to include difference is to limit the potential for creativity with the design within the design process. And I'll now pass you along to Dr. Nunella Ivanova. Thank you, Chris, and hello, everybody. So in the interest of accessibility and also for those who may be wondering about my funny accent, I'm a young Eastern European uh, female with uh, very pale skin, a long uh, dark hair and a big smile, I hope. Uh, so my name is Ninella and I lead the inclusive design for business impact area here at the center, where our mission is to get companies to uh, engage with, clarify and deliver on their highest vision and purpose. Or simply put, to use people centered inclusive design to make better business. This area was originally set up in 2019 to formalize our long legacy of working with business and industry uh, to innovate products, services, user experience uh, through inclusion. And a case in point, uh, which Melanie touched on, is our coll recent collaboration with OnePlus Technologies, who asked us to help them define what resilience meant for their brand, for their business, and for next generation technologies. So we put together a, a six day design sprint with 10 uh, design researchers from the center and a mix of RCA students uh, who created a range of outputs that would support uh, personal collective global resilience through inclusive ethical and sustainable design. So this informed OnePlus uh, on their pursuit for inclusive innovation that aligns with their vision and slogan Never Settle and also with their aim to impact how future generations use technologies. But above and beyond that, beyond, uh, Mel talked about building back better. So the impact of COVID-19 on people, on business, on industries, uh, on global economies has heightened the need for uh, inclusive innovation and application of inclusive design in rethinking business continuity, growth and the way forward. So here, the World Economic Forum, UK government, the big five are all in agreement, innovation-based thinking, people-centered and stakeholder-inclusive approaches are essential to worldwide building back better. So the big questions we're asking here today, how can inclusive design uh, enable businesses to recover, transform and flourish in a post-pandemic and fourth industrial revolution world? What is the role of design in enabling companies to identify and seize opportunities for innovation in an overstretched global economy? So how can we do this together? Uh, alongside our usual activities, knowledge exchange, collaborative research, executive education and consultancy, we're launching a series of open uh, events that will seek to advance the applications of inclusivity thinking, research and practice in business redesign and development. So this is the first one, design.continuity. It will bring together experts from across design, business, uh, economics and technology to explore the scope for design-led, people-centered and stakeholder inclusive approaches to business recovery and recreation in a pandemic impacted world. So do watch this space and do get in touch if you wanted to join in the conversation. Uh, thank you for listening and I will now hand you over to Sean. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Donahue. 
I have dark brown and wonderfully graying short hair. I wear rectangular shaped tortoise colored glasses that I think complement my oval shaped face well. Uh, I embody what whiteness is in the United States. I have pale melatonin deficient skin. I'm middle-aged. I speak English as my primary language. I present as male and of Northern European descent. My great grandparents immigrated to the United States through Philadelphia for that very promise of what it offered people that look like me from Europe. I further migrated to Southern California 30 years ago where I acknowledge that I live and work on the ancestral and unceded land of the Gabrielino and Tonga people. I'm gonna to talk today about inclusive design for social impact, an emerging space um, that the center has been working on um, uh, uh, for the last decade um, and shaping to ask a new set of questions. Uh, sorry. Starting with work uh, around the globe, uh, inclusive design, starting with the premise of inclusive design does not just define a problem. It offers interventions that impact the day-to-day -day realities of people's lives. It's the realities, the people, and the different worldviews that this group hopes to expand to from around the world. Our focus on social impact, um, inclusive design for social impact is concerned with expanding this range and how it's positioned within global perspectives. We focus on a few principles, expanding those methods and tools that define inclusive design, not just working from where it's come from, but looking at different languages and cultures of engagement as a way to start that conversation. Not paternalizing inclusive design, design, reframing the questions and the different perspectives that those questions come from, making space for not starting that conversation, but hosting conversations that that lead those dialogues. To engage with communities as part of that co-creation endeavor to define those spaces and not use good as the rhetoric and the framework for asking those questions and defining the kinds of things that are able to support these global spaces and the realities of those lives. As I said, this builds on a range of work that ranges from Qatar. Uh, I'm presenting an image of three people talking, that, talking um, in a construction space wearing uh, vests, um, safety vests. Uh, one of those uh, is a um, migrant laborer, male um, in Qatar. The other two are female um, uh, participants in um, the engagement that are learning more about mapping the journey of what does it mean to work in that space as a way to define what are the questions that are important um, and the challenges of this. I'm presenting a second project um, called um, Aging in the Vertical City, which was based on in Hong Kong, that looks at what aging looks like um, in a space where verticality is the preference. What does um, joy, how do people find food um, that they want to engage in for issues of quality of life, not just how are they supported medically? And how does that redefine through the terms of um, uh, filial piety, what it means to provide quality aging care to communities as they age, um, uh, as we all age and as they age um, in place. The last project I'll show is um, uh, Tinkle, um, Toilet Innovation. And this is a project, an ongoing project um, that's uh, developed into establishing new knowledge and exchange around the globe, an initiative led by Joanne Bichard and Gail Ramstein, looking at public toilets and the ways that they have roles in other parts um, around the world to support um, people and their care. The kinds of questions go further in that though. They go about evaluating the, the futures um, that we put out there, not just the tangible things that are lives. This is a project um, that I worked on that looks at industrial futures and who's included and who's not. These are stills that show people in their homes um, uh, from those um, uh, depictions, uh, predominantly of uh, 20 or 30 age group and um, all white. Um, whose future is that and who is that for? And beginning asking the tough questions that come with that. The last image I'll show is of a small family neighborhood in Mexico City that starts to reposition um, technologies that predominantly rely on a Western Eurocentric orientation um, thinking about um, mobile um, mobility 
um, and um, uh, uh, how that represents technologies in family neighborhoods and small neighborhoods around the road, as opposed to affluent neighborhoods in predominantly American or European cities. Well, thank you, Sean, Ninella, and Chris. Can I invite you back to the virtual stage um, to switch your cameras on? Quick fire questions for each of our panelists. Um, in the um, um, starting with Chris. Um, Chris, you know, inclusive design has this history of age and ability. What might be the barriers or the similarities? the challenges or the opportunities that we see as we um, increasingly apply modes of practice to looking at exclusion by age or, um, or, or, or uh, sorry, by uh, race or gender. Bearing in mind, race is a very ill-defined thing at the moment and um, gender, the WHO defined 54 different types of uh, um, uh, def definitions of gender identifier um, recently. So, you know, it's a very open, fluid landscape. What might we see? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I understand there's complexity there, and that's, I think, what we always try to lean into. But I think um, race and gender have always been embedded in our work because, of course, age and ability apply across those themes as much as they do any other. So it's intertwined in that sense. Um, I mean, I think within all our projects, something that's worked really well in the past is to have researchers with lived experience of the context we're designing for. So if you can do that, perfect. Um, if not, I think at the very least, it's it's very much getting into this kind of uh, space of empathy and and genuinely engaging with people with the lived experience. I think that's, that's crucial. Um, and I'd also say in that, Inclusive design requires, you know, commitment and energy and resource. I think that's often underestimated. You know, I think uh, if you don't treat it seriously, if you don't really put the resource into it that it needs, then it becomes tokenistic. Uh, and that almost seems like the buzzword of inclusive design could be dangerous if it gets in, in some way diluted. There's not that real purposeful, uh, you know, approach to being inclusive. In terms of um, just like lessons, I guess, I think that's maybe about consciously checking that no groups are left underrepresented and, and paying attention not only to the loudest voices, but paying attention to the voices that aren't there, the, the unheard voices, you know, and working out w what's the barrier here, you know, uh, is it power dynamics, you know, how can we create uh, spaces that will work for everyone? How can we be more equitable? Thank you, Chris. And moving on to Melanie, I'm going to twin my questions with questions from the chat. So, um, you know, there's a question here of, um, is inclusive design a sort of wicked solution to wicked problems? But also we talked about, Ali Jafari asks, we spoke about social and spiritual transformation, which is paramount to the future. So, how will this transformation happen? Is this part of the um, design.wicked event that you might be running in the new year? Thank you, Rama. Um, yes, the design.wicked on the 10th of January, which promises to be a great event. Uh, a wicked problem uh, is what we understand by a wicked problem is something that is hard, if not impossible to solve. And in that genre of problems, we're talking about climate change, healthcare for all, hunger, addressing world hunger, poverty. These are, uh, are really huge problems and they're systemic problems. Um, where I think inclusive design can really make, by its very nature, inclusive design is empathic. The, uh, the, the, the inclusive designer employs empathy in their thinking, and that's the beginning of real inclusion. We've also got this issue of systemic um, in inclusion and complexity. If design thinking can't crack it, then, you know, <laughs> what, what chance have we got of actually solving wicked problems? But there's also the other aspect, and I think this is where people, where we at the Helen Hamlin Center are in a fabulous position to start leading discussions, dialogue, and also practice. How do we 
sometimes we learn by practice and sometimes we we learn, we start theories and then we test it out in practice. But one of the big questions for me of inclusive design for, for wicked problems is this. Inclusion needs to be addressed really intelligently because inclusion isn't a free for all because that what you get there is something called overload, stress and tiredness. So intelligence and empathy has to be applied. I saw uh, somebody put a question about bringing in children into this, into this kind of discussion. Wisdom and, uh, you know, balanced uh, dis- decision making for the problem at hand is really important. And designers through their training and empathy are really well skilled at doing this. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Melanie. Um, Ninella, can we move on to yourself? And again, I'm going to twin questions. Um, You know, I wanted to find out what sort of most excites you about future practice in the business space. And Christine Hemphill, asks, you know, what do you see as the biggest gap between inclusive intent and inclusive action, again, within the business space? Thank you, Rama. Thank you for the great questions. Um, I'll start by saying that our world is designed, always designed by someone. So like it or not, our world is designed, whether it's our home, whether it's our cities or the organizations through the workplace design and culture. And that would apply both to physical and intangible. So the way the question for me that speaks really well to the question asked from the audience is not if, but how. So not if design is included, that that's that is a fact, irrespective. You know, for a long time, designers were fighting to have a seat at the table. It doesn't matter if a designer is at the table, design is there. But how is a question of quality? How well is something designed to fulfill that purpose and and bridge that gap? And is it adding any higher value than this? So for me, that's where inclusive design can add uh, real value to any conversation in any organization. And we see that as a two-pronged approach. So that on one hand, we have the internal uh, and that excites me uh, the most, looking at how traditionally the same principles of applied to innovate products and services can be applied to the organization itself through building you know, a better environment, a better culture, new processes through inclusion for, for staff and stakeholders. Or we know we talk about the people-centered approach to business continuity, but also externally. So beyond uh, innovating something quite specific, how are we creating value and impact for the person of one, but also for society at large? So I can't say that I would prefer one to the other. I think we're really happy to work with companies across the spectrum to help them achieve the impact that they're seeking to create. So we're talking about business impact. I would like to hear from you. What is the, what is the impact that you're, wanting to, you're seeking to create through inclusive design. And I'll be very happy to collaborate along those conversations. Thank you, Nelly. And uh, Sean, we haven't forgotten you. Um, It's really thinking about, it's this sort of double barreled question for you. I'm thinking about deploying inclusive design in a global and social space as your projects talked about. is there a point at which you can try to get too inclusive? And that was an earlier question in the chat that I wanted to pull out. And twinning it with something from Josh, um, a 45 year old African-American who speaks to, who asks the question of at what point does designing for the future fix current problems like inequality and access? So at what point are we too inclusive and when does the future start to kick in? Yeah, two great questions, and and thank you, Joshua, for um, uh, offering offering that um, to the group. I think there's a couple things. I think that, uh, and I, there was another uh, question by Ren Scott that asked about the the uh, COVID and the pandemic and how that may impacted. And is there anything positive that came out of that? And I think to speak to your first question, uh, the inability to deploy, I think, is one of the things that has come out of that. That. Um, relying on local resources and building capacity in place, not um, deploying to places to do the work. Um, And recognizing that um, what historically may have been seen as 
um, communities or spaces or geographies that have it together don't. Um, and that we actually have uh, plenty to learn um, in those spaces from what may have been considered um, uh, uh, a reach out spaces for design historically, uh, that that's a two-way dialogue um, uh, and, and not a one-way dialogue. And so I think um, to, to that end, I would, I would speak to that. Um, on the idea of improving the systems, I think one of the things that you have to ask yourselves when you have this discussion uh, within a global context are, what are the systems that are right for people? Um, and that not assuming that um, uh, equitab equitability looks like um, how we think democracy looks like, that it doesn't look like um, the kinds of conversations we think families should have, um, that, it, that it manifests in lots of different ways, and that that has to question those fundamental systems that we rely on um, to be mechanisms of equitability, where a system that privileges one individual as leadership isn't necessarily equitable, um, and that that system has to be fundamentally rethinked, rethought, not just replaced with um, different people. Um, and I think that's the exciting part because that's both a question we're asking ourselves um, uh, um, as people in the spaces that we are in um, and uh, around the world um, um, as part of that dialogue and we're all learning from that way. And so I invite um, these conversations to have um, in um, how we're, we're engaging in that world and to and have that dialogue about how, how we create that equitability across spaces, not just in a space yeah. or from a space. And I think all of all of you have responded by saying we want to know more and we want to hear from you. And I love some of the dialogues that are going on in the chat. You know, Teresa asked the question of how can something be too inclusive? And um, Ashling has replied, we wish, Teresa. Um, and this um, Zoom is a very sort of, um, you know, it's, it's a necessary uh, piece of technology, but we would we look forward to those moments when we can get in the same room. And part of today is really to open up those conversations and dialogues, because we feel we're at the start of a journey. We want to hear your wisdoms. So I'm going to, um, it's a very quick panel discussion, um, but I'm going to ask each of the speakers to just take a moment to think um, about one thing. Um, it's the Ren Scott question of, in your opinion, what is the best thing that the pandemic has prompted in terms of inclusion and diversity? So whilst we, I give you a moment just to speak to that, I wanted to just um, address a question from Poppy Eastwood um, talking about, um, was it necessary to make the distinction that designers aren't just painters um, in a world that uh, where the visual arts um, you know, really underpin STEM. Uh, sometimes I feel it is poppy as designers are rele relegated to the area of aestheticians, um, of form givers who are brought in at the end of the process. So the comment was really aimed at, um, you know, it's just interesting that when you type in the world designer, the word designer, that that's the icon that most mobile phone manufacturers bring up. Um, the creative industries does bring more to the UK and lots of other countries than legal or finance. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's worth saying, maybe I'm a bit of a design activist, but flying the flag for designers to be everywhere, upstairs and upstream. So if we can run in the order you're in on my screen. So um, your, your one sentence answer to Ren Scott, Melanie, then Ninella, then Chris, then Sean. Melanie. Thank you, Rama. Uh, I'd like to leave you with one thought, uh, the question of inclusion. Uh, one size fits all inclusion doesn't exist. Inclusion is contextual and it's dimensional. Contextual, for example, in educational health and dimensional in the level of inclusion, the type of inclusion and the degrees of inclusion, or we are heading for you know, another uh, mess. So I hope that helps in terms of actually defining some aspects of why is, oh, yeah, why is an intelligent inclusion. Thank you, Mel. Intelligent inclusion, love that. Ninella. Uh, thank you, Rama. Uh, I think for me, that's, uh, that's lived empathy. Uh, 
There's a danger with uh, empathy and also the other two values that we talk about in creative leadership uh, to remain aspirational values. I think the, the pandemic has really showed us what empathy looks like in practice. Care for another coming together as a community, that need for personal connection and touch. And I'd really like for us to carry that forward uh, post pandemic and, and to work from there together collaboratively, whether that's across communities, whether that's across countries or across disciplines. Thank you. It's, you paint a picture of something I want to live in. Um, Chris. Uh, yeah, if I understood the, the question right, the kind of best thing that the pandemic's prompted, um, I think yeah. something that we'd like to hold on to um, is something that I experienced in the Heart and Soul project. I think um, at first we thought that was going to be really difficult to engage, you know, people with learning disabilities, brain injuries, autism, you know, this kind of neurodiverse collective. But actually, forums like this, I think, gave options and, and new ways to connect and some flexibility within it. You know, if I got overwhelmed, I could turn my camera off. You know, I, I, I've got control. I'm in a space that I have control of. That I can engage in the conversation. So I think that's been really nice and that's been really telling. And the, the best Zoom rooms I have are with heart and soul. Like, it's, it's worked so well. Thank you, Chris. Um, and, a, a, you know, a live example there. Sean, you get to round up this section yeah of course thank you um uh I, I would just i would just continue with what i had offered earlier in the sense of it really allowed places that were um uh to show how to build capacity um from a local and a regional level and that there is um there are resources there are knowledge capitals there are um mechanisms that can do that um, uh, without being told how to do that and how do we embrace that moving forward in inclusive ways that allow us to benefit from that um, uh, uh, as part of a way that we learn as part of the, the wider design community starts to build equitable relationships. Thank you, Sean. A great phrase to end on, um, equitable relationships. Um, if I can ask the screen just to come back up, we've got two minutes of things to say. We have a little surprise for you. Um, which is um, um, laying out all your answers from the exercise. We've done a little mapping. So Juliet, could I ask you to bring that onto screen? So here we have live, our fast fingered designer, Juliet, has just brought in um, some of the things, you know, just doing a simple word cluster, what lives around the four axes. Um, and I think, you know, we've got everything from cast in India was a big one, financial background, neurodiversity. I saw that one coming up again and again, emotional dysfunction, um, emotion. Um, so function and dysfunction, opportunity, language, education, beliefs and attitudes. So I think this is um, something we will take away and do a proper mapping with and share with you all. Um, thank you, Juliet, for working so quickly. It's really um, uh, energizing and encouraging. Um, thank you all for your attention and your questions. We wish you love and light in your inclusive endeavors. And we really um, welcome your voices and we need them as we walk forward in this inclusive future. So thank you all. Much love to you. And we look forward to seeing you and hearing from you at the next events. Uh, bye, everyone. Bye-bye. You can also hear everyone saying bye to each other in the chat as well. <laughs> so we'll just stay on for a couple of minutes to pick up comments.